Big thanks to Napoleon Grills for sponsoring this episode. The future of ribeyes is about to change. Really, we're doing it right now. Let's go. Some people complain that the food industry have been at a standstill for a very, very long time. Butchers are doing what they've always been done. People that sell meat are doing it. They've always been doing it. And the farmers are breeding the cows like they always have been doing it. This is not true. It's not true. We're developing. We're evolving. You are evolving. We're going to introduce something today that you've never ever seen before done to the ribeye steak. Food Innovation 101 right here on this channel. And to show you, <laughs> I ordered this piece especially for you. Because this is the ribeye and the New York strip connected together. And for the people that don't know, the back of the cow, that's right there where the humans have this muscle. You just turn around, pinch your back. That's where the muscle sit, where the New York strip comes from and the ribeye. And through the whole length of the back of the cow, you're gonna find this. A lot longer, of course, but this is the essence. And we're going to turn it into something new. New York strip, new, new, new ribeye. The new New York ribeye. Look at that, that right there. That is the ribeye. And if we turn it around on the other side, you can see the New York strip. Isn't that cool? One piece that has it all. And I, everyone that is in like a meat profession and that's watching this video, I challenge you to follow along and try this. We're gonna do some preparation. This is the main ingredient for what's going to be one of the most delicious spice mixes, fresh ones, that you've ever had on a steak. But with the technique that I'm using, some people have a problem. And this is my problem. My pressed cast iron pan by Scottsburg, and it looks like this. And people think that's horrible. This is horrible. This is a Teflon coated pan, which has been destroyed and it has, well, lots of Teflon that's not on it anymore. And most likely that went into my food. This is okay. And let me show you by cooking some tomatoes in it. We're gonna use the sizzle zone. So I'm gonna turn on the gas and light it up. Letting it become red glowing hot. Then I'm gonna put my Scottsburg pressed cast iron pan on, drizzle in a little bit of olive oil, put in 10 tasty tom tomatoes, add a half sweet onion, two cloves of garlic, and when it's well underway, half a tablespoon of fresh thyme and half a tablespoon of fresh rosemary. When the tomato starts popping, I'm gonna press it with my burger press. I'm going to fry down those tomatoes. What most people don't understand about tomatoes is that you have to treat them like if you were barbecue. It is a vegetable or fruit, whatever you want to call this, that you have to cook low and slow. You have to let it simmer. Of course, you can buy it into ribs while they're raw. They're not gonna taste like capacho. The same with the tomato. You can bite into it raw, but it's not gonna release its maximum potential. Evaporating all of the moisture, sweetening up, building up crust and flavor. That is the way that you make tomato taste the best it can taste. Well, this is what I want to see. Take a look right here. You see that? That cast iron right there is blackening up my tomatoes. And as you can see, all of the sugar in the tomatoes start to caramelize. That's what we need to have. Once it's cooled down, I'm going to put it in my blender, add a quarter cup of olive oil, a tablespoon of salt, a teaspoon of ground black pepper, and then I'm going to grind it up until we have a smooth paste. Now, together, let's take a look at this cast iron press pan. And for people that don't know and say, wow, that's not a cast iron pan. Yes, it is. It's a new cast iron technique where they take cast iron and then press it into a pan. So it's becoming lighter and it comes with a stainless steel handle that's hollow inside. So you have all the convenience of a modern pan. You won't burn your hands. And the good thing, it's not made of Teflon. So you won't die of it. You're making the yeah, Teflon yeah, people yeah, angry. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, yeah. Oh, the Teflon Mafia. Let's not go there. Morrison, don't smile at me. Let's take a look, come on. Let's clean this up a little bit. This pan looks the same as it did before. I scraped off the chunky bits and went through it with just a paper towel and this pan looks good again. Now, of course, it doesn't have that super shiny patina that you're used to with cast iron pans, and it's easy to get that back as well. Just put in a little bit of oil, rub it in, and you're done. It looks shiny and good again. Now, of course, you can put on 12 of these layers and build up that carbon layer that makes it non-stick, but to me, it's a tool 
and I have to use it every single day. So I won't be recarbonizing because then when you put in tomatoes, you're gonna say, oh no, I put on 12 layers. It took me three hours to do that. This is it. Now we're getting to the part where we're gonna be slicing. And uh, well, you can see that it's a bit dry outside and the meat turned absolutely freaking red. So it almost looks like dry age. Time for us to show you what to do with your new ribeye. The new New York steak. Start slicing from one side to the other and just one sawing motion. Get a big but thin slice steak out of this piece of meat. And this is what the end result will look like. It looks like something like a skirt steak or something. But then more tender and more tasty. Now this is the first time I'm trying this and I just discovered that if I take off the chain that sits on this outside, I'm reducing the size of my steak and I'm gonna have more control over how I cut the steak and they will be better. Therefore, I'm just gonna switch up that technique and be careful with your hand. Always put it on the meat flat to keep it level. Don't all of a sudden point your knife upwards. Keep your eye on it. I want it as thin as possible without breaking it. Because the meat's so tender, it's a little bit more challenging than let's say with pork, but that's a good thing. So we should be able to do it. Yeah. Now this is the perfect one. I'm gonna pour on my red spice mix, brush it in, and this is heavily seasoned with salt. So it's definitely a spice mix. It's not intended as a sauce to eat straight up. It's a spice mix. And we're gonna flip that steak, put a little bit of it on every steak, layer by layer. Let that spice mix do its job. You can consider this a marinade, but it's only gonna be on here for around 10 minutes before it hits the grill. So it's not really marinating. It's more of adding flavor to your steak while you're gonna cook it. And once it looks good like this, then it's time to fire up the grill. And I mean the real grill. I'm gonna open it up and I'm going to turn on all of my burners. Now I'm gonna close the lid again and I'm going to give the barbecue a little bit of time to warm up. I want those heavy duty R RVS, I want to say, stainless steel grill grates. I want them to be fully hot before we start cooking. And after about 10 minutes, the barbecue is running at a temperature of 200 degrees Celsius, which is around 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And that means we can start grilling. Oh yeah, look at that, smoking hot. Now remember, there's already oil in the spice mix. All we need to do is put this new New York strip steak on the barbecue. Are you ready for this? Well, let's go. And with a closed lid, I'm thinking about giving it maybe 30 seconds because some pieces of that steak are so thin that they're going to be cooked a la minute, which is, oh, it's a minute. That's not right. In a la half a minute. Whoa. And how do you know that it's almost done? You can see the gray coming through, a little bit of puddling of the juices. And then it is done. Look at that, absolutely freaking gorgeous. And I wanna go straight into the next level and turn this new steak into a cheese steak. So what I did is I took out my kitchen machine, cubed up some cheese and grated it. This is fresh young Gouda. Let's sprinkle that on and let this melt while that steak is resting. And of course, I'm gonna roll it up, preserving the heat that will help the cheese melt there we go. Boy, oh. Give it about three to four minutes till the cheese really melted through and through. And now it's time to slice into it. Oh. Delicious cheese steak. Let me give that a try. Mm. Oh. Oh. That is so tender. I can't fathom how tender that is. Absolutely mind-blowing, and the side bones, it tastes freaking delicious. I don't believe you. You don't believe me? No. So you start, so you decide to steal my steak? If you would do that to Ava, our dog, you would lose a hand. If you want to try the technique or the sauce, of course, we've written everything down for you. It's on our website, pitmasterx.com. The link's down below, so which will take you straight to the recipe. 